The ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. And um, the ANA would like to thank our eLearning partner, Graysheet, for their support of the eLearning program. Today, we've got Caleb Audet, and he's going to be presenting on the incredibly diverse world of Confederate States paper money. Uh, you're going to be muted for this presentation. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box or the Q&A box, and I'll read them to the presenter at the end of the presentation. Um, so without further, further ado, I, I turn it over to, to Caleb. Thanks, Nate. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about Confederate States paper money. So it's a fun topic and we won't get to everything I wanted to cover today, but we'll start it off with this. Uh, so a few, few things before we begin. Uh, first of all, uh, just a little quick note, there's some terms throughout the presentation since we're talking about the Confederate States. Um, they may offend some people nowadays, slavery would be one term, um, but I'm not here to offend anybody, I'm just here to present on this and it's a really interesting topic. It's got lots of cool parts to it. So um, just keep that in mind throughout the whole presentation. Also, I'm gonna be talking a lot about like T1 or uh, T17 or T14. So what do I mean when I say T whatever it is? Uh, type T basically stands for type. So it's just the type of Confederate paper money. This would be T1, this one would be T17, etc. So without further ado, let's get into the actual presentation. I just thought before I we do this, I'd share a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a 15 year old young numismatist from Minnesota and I moved to Florida about six years ago. I've been collecting various types of coins and currencies since I was actually about three years old. I started with the US coins, so the wheat pennies, Liberty nickels, uh, filling the Whitman folders, and then I got into the world coins, and then I transitioned to world paper money when I was probably six or seven, and then finally I went into the US paper money, uh, so the lower end, large size, fractional, obsoletes, confederates, and then I started with the graded stuff when we moved here, so six years ago, and I'm getting into the Confederates more now, especially since doing this presentation because it's such a cool topic. A uh, few awards I won also first place for the YN Literary Awards competition, uh, which is actually put on by the ANA of 2018 for my article on Confederate paper money, and then also third place in 2020 for my article on the people of America's treasury notes of 1890 to 91. And then I also won first place for paper money guarantees fund show grading contest that was down here in Tampa uh, in 2018 PMG. I'm sure you've all heard of them. I had to grade 15 notes in 10 minutes without any outside assistance to the best of my ability. Uh, and then down here, you'll see, I have my email right here. That's blue, so I don't know if you can see that, but don't worry if you don't get it now because I'm gonna go back at the end of the presentation when we're taking questions and then you can copy it down. So first of all, we're gonna get into the history, just a brief overview of the history of these notes. Uh, so Confederate States paper money, they're also called grayback dollars actually right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but it's you can sort of see the blue gray back right here if you look on my camera. Uh, that's This is the back of a T69 Confederate note. So that's sort of why they're called grayback dollars because uh, of their blue gray back. Uh, the first one was issued like two months after the Confederacy had formed, so that would be T1. Uh, they faced many problems from the start, especially inflation. Um, values plunged sometimes at a rate of 20% after a big battle was lost or somebody important passed away. And since the Confederacy was, as a result of that, so short on funds, they couldn't really pay much people to design, engrave, print their notes, etc. So they had both skilled and unskilled printers that came onto the scene. Uh, down here, actually, I've included all, really all of the uh, printers, lithographers, engravers that printed the notes for the Confederacy. So the first two national and Southern Bank note company are in New York and New Orleans, respectively. They're divisions of the American Bank note company. Hoyer and Ludwig were in Richmond, Virginia. 
Uh, Jules Manouvrier was in New Orleans and his contract was terminated after only one uh, printing one type T12. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, because just he some of the notes basically some of the notes were stolen and he just really didn't do a good job on the one he printed. Uh, Leggett, Keaton, and Jimball were in Richmond, Virginia, and Leggett was accused accused of being an informant for the union. So then he got thrown out, and they became Keaton, and Jimball in Richmond. And then Blanton Duncan was in Columbia, South Carolina, and then Richmond, Virginia. After Memminger. Uh, more on him later. He invited Duncan to open a printing office there and print banknotes for the Confederacy. Memminger was basically the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, J.T. Patterson was in Columbia, South Carolina. Archer and Daly were in Richmond, Virginia, and they mainly printed the stocks and bonds, so we won't get into them much. Uh, Archer and Halpin is the final one there in Richmond, Virginia as well, and they only printed T-72, Type 72, uh, it's a 50 cent denomination, actually the last note printed by the Confederacy. Uh, so another huge problem for the co Confederates, probably actually even more than um, the inflation was counterfeits. Counterfeits all throughout the war, the Union was flooding the Confederacy with fake Confederate money. They commissioned Northern printers and sometimes Southern printers uh, to issue, and it played a large part in inflation. If you did the counterfeits well, you would do well and you would have lots of money. Uh, even some even some that are not very good, they circulated well and it's like, how did that pass as real? Um, Samuel Upham was a big counterfeiter, I should mention him. Um, he was actually in the South and some he passed off as fake and then some he tried to pass as real. So next thing is how to tell if you have a counterfeit, and this is important if you're looking at raw notes and you don't, if you're questioning the authenticity of it. Uh, actually, so Sam, Sam Gelbert from the ANA for reminding me to put something in here about this. Uh, so the first, really the first thing is brown and black signatures. If it has a black signature, most of the counter, most of them are going to be counterfeits, and if it has a brown signature, it's not always going to be. Uh, real but it's most likely going to be um so the next really the next thing is you can tell some unique characteristics for example i was looking at a t29 and i have it actually on the next slide and there's several unique characteristics for example uh the type of paper that they printed it on it was just too thin that was really the first alert uh to me and the real one was printed on high quality bond paper which was really thick uh, the second alert to me was the signature combination, although it was brown, uh, it was Thayer and Jones, and Thayer and Jones for that type anyways was a hugely counterfeited combination. Probably, there's probably more counterfeits than real ones, actually. And then this is a really good example of unique characteristic for that type. Uh, in the bottom left, if it says B. Duncan, it's real because Blanton Duncan, that was a printer. If it's R. Duncan, then it's fake. And this one had R. Duncan, so it was fake. Uh, the best the best advice I can give to you is to buy a book on counterfeit Confederate currency. There's a whole bunch of them that exist. The one that I use is George Trumbull's book, uh, counter, Guidebook of Counterfeit Confederate Currency. I don't know if you can see that. I, I'm going to show it on the next few slides, so don't worry if you can't see it. So this is the T29, and you can see the difference um, in the paper, first of all, and then you also have um, down here on the left, you can see R. Duncan instead of the B. Duncan. You can kind of see it right here, but I blew it up so you can see it better. And then, of course, the Aaron Jones. You can't really tell by how crude it is because the original one right here was crude anyways. Uh, so now I'm going to give you a few seconds and I'm going to see if you can decipher, you don't have to type it in the chat, just the top or bottom one, whichever one you think is the counterfeit and which one is real. So I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And this one stumped me too when I first looked at it and it stumps a lot of people because a lot of people think that whichever one's the counterfeit is re actually real. So I'm gonna go ahead and reveal it now so you can see it. And if you guess the top one, uh -oh, then you are correct. 
So the top one is the counterfeit. You can see there's several reasons. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in here if I can. So first of all, you can see right here, Minerva, uh, her nose looks really, really big. And down here, it's sort of more real lifelike. Um, and you can also see like the features on this one are more highlighted than uh, down here. Also, this the top one, the ink is a little bit darker, but you can't really tell by that because uh, they did different tints of the green or different shades of the green. Uh, the main way you can tell right here is the black signatures. These are basically black. So you can, that's really your first alert right there. And another thing right here, see if here's the two, I stuck the two um, books that I use anyways right here. Uh, this one's by Pierre Fricky, the Collecting Confederate Paper Money Guide uh, from 2014. It's good, it's a good book. Um, like I said, it's the one that I use. It's got all the types. It's got all the PF varieties. What's a PF variety? Well, PF varieties, pure fricky varieties, they can be anywhere from uh, wrong plate letters to different types of ink to different watermarks, all sorts of different things. There's a lot of different things that go into the PF varieties. And then over here is the counterfeit Confederate currency book uh, that I use. So right here, you can see the rarity scale. I'm gonna be talking a lot about rarity. Uh, so I thought I'd mention this. R1 is the most common, 100,000 plus known, and R16 is the least common, none seen or known. They're, they could be out there, but we haven't discovered them yet. New people are, people are discovering new things all the time. So like I said, that doesn't mean that they're not out there. Next is President Jefferson Davis, because he's a very important part of the Confederacy, obviously he's the president. So he appears on lots of the notes. Uh, he was born in Kentucky in, he's actually born a year and a half earlier than um, Abraham Lincoln was. He was born, Davis was born in 1808. And he was also born in the same state that Lincoln was born in Kentucky. He was educated first at Transylvania University in Kentucky, uh, but then he moved to the West Point Military Academy in 1824, so when he was 16. He served in the Black Hawk War of 1832, where he met his first wife, Sarah Taylor, uh, who was actually the daughter of Zachary Taylor, and he's the future, he was the future 12th president of the United States at the time. Unfortunately, she died shortly after they got married. Uh, she contracted malaria and did not survive. So a few years after that, his political career began after he came back from the Black Hawk War. He first became a U.S. representative to, um, of Mississippi, and then shortly after he started, he quit that because he couldn't stay away from the battlefield. He went to fight in the Mexican War. When he came back from that in 1847, he became a senator. And then in 1853, President Pierce gave him the job of U.S. Secretary of War. He was arguably, many people argue that he was the best to ever hold that position, but he is definitely one of the best. Uh, he went back to the Senate in 1857, but then when Mississippi seceded in 1861, he followed them, and then he was chosen to lead the Confederate States of America as president, a job he didn't really want. He would have much rather had a position in the military. He was a good president in some ways, and he was a bad president in other ways, just like every president. He was also unpopular and popular with some. He loved his, people loved his fervent support of the Confederacy. He was always behind their cause, and then also how proper he was at the dinner galas he went to or the meetings. Uh, however, he did not do his job correctly all the time. He promoted those who didn't do their job correctly, and he didn't get along with those that disagreed with him. Never could turn the tide of the war for the Confederacy, so that was another reason he was unpopular. And to the left, here's a picture of him when he was the president. And then to the right is after he was captured and imprisoned. And this is actually towards the end of his life. Uh, this was probably one of the last photos they took of him. Next is the Confederate flag because you're gonna see that a lot on the different types. Um, T T10 would be one of those. So you're gonna see the, the stars and bars flag. I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, this is the stars and bars flag. It's the first flag of the Confederacy. 
uh, it has Austrian origins because its designer, Nicola Marshall, was actually Austrian. Uh, it flew from various changes as more states seceded uh, from March 4th of 1861 to May 1st of 1863. It looks like a carbon copy of the U.S. flag with basically less stars and bars on it, but it's actually more Austrian origins. So here's the changes. You can see here's the Austrian flag up to the left. And then uh, down here, you can see the first one. This one had seven stars. And it, was, it flew from March 4th to May 21st of 1861. And basically, you can just see they, all they did was they took some blue and then they put the stars on there and that was the Confederate flag. Uh, so the second one was nine stars. That one flew from May 21st through July 2nd of 1861. And these stars represent the states that seceded. Um, the third one was 11 stars. That one flew from July 2nd through November 28th of 1861. And then finally, you got the fourth one, which is the 13 star flag. And that one flew from November 28th of 1861 to May 1st of 1863. And that's 13 states. That was all that seceded. So the final total was 13 states. This one is the uh, stainless banner. And this one was designed and used from May 1st of 1863 all the way until March 4th of 1865. There's several people that could have designed it, but the most widely accepted person is William Tappan Thompson, who was the editor for the Savannah Morning News newspaper. And he put this flag in the newspaper. So that was why people really think he was the one that designed it. Uh, today, people don't really do the use the white. They just really use the... Um, battle flag right here. And then finally, the third national flag, the bloodstained banner. Uh, this was the third and final national flag, and it represented the many lives lost for the Confederate cause. Uh, Major Arthur Lee Rogers designed it, and he described the meanings kind of cool. He described the white as being a symbol of purity and innocence. And then he stated that the red represented courage and bravery. And he, of course, then you got the battle flag right there. He argued the reason to add the red bar was because if you were looking and you saw, I mean, there's a whole bunch of white here and the union was looking, they were fighting and they saw that flag and it was billowing, billowing in the wind. They would think, oh, all the white, they're surrendering because they might not be able to see the battle flag. But if they added the red star or the red stripe, then they would be able to see that and go, oh, they're not surrendering. And then they would have to keep fighting. And it flew from March 4th of 1865 all the way until the end of the Civil War, May 9th of 1865. Now, finally, we're going to get into the types. Uh, so we're going to, there's a total of 72 uh, types, and there's a whole bunch of stocks and bonds, but I'm not going to get into them. I don't collect them, and I'm not well-versed in them. Uh, Confederate currency, they have many beautiful designs, of course. And so actually some, if not most, have no relation to the Confederacy at all. Uh, examples would be like the sailing ship on T9 or the blacksmith on T19. They didn't always have the designers or artists who were very talented. Uh, some were, some weren't, like I said before, because they couldn't afford them. So that's why they didn't have more vignettes related to the Confederacy. Uh, many of the designs featured, featured humanistic depictions of Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. You'll see, as we progress through, you'll see Ceres, you'll see Liberty, Minerva, Justice, all those different Roman uh, depictions of goddesses. And those were basically the vignettes that were the most readily available. So that's why they used them, because as a result, they were cheap. A uh, quick note before we get into this first series, uh, which was authorized March 9th of 1861. Um, from what I've seen through the years with auctions and all that eBay and um, the cancel notes are worth a little bit less than the uncanceled notes and are actually also a little bit less to buy uh, because there's a lot of them. There's more of them around than the uncanceled notes. Uh, what do I mean when I say cancel? Well, when the Confederacy, when it was pretty much all done and they were going to redeem the notes for real money, um, they, they had um, tools that they used or they had stamps that they used or sometimes they took a knife to it and slit cancels or hammer cut cancels. There's a whole bunch of different types of cancels. Sometimes they had punch, uh, punch cancels. 
And it was basically just to say that the notes were redeemed already for the money and basically to prevent people from going back and trying to redeem them again and get money over and over and over again. Uh, if you have hammer cut canceled, that's basically the least type, that's the least noticeable type of cancellation and the most common. Uh, they're worth about half the value of what an uncanceled example is worth. You'll see that on many of the types. Uh, if you have whole canceled notes or punch canceled notes, the value can be cut by 60 or even 70% sometimes. It just depends on what type you're talking about. The only exception if you have the rare notes like uh, the T1 note, which is on the next slide, or the T35 Indian Princess note, those are both rare notes and you'd be lucky to have even the lowest of the low examples because you just don't see them anymore. Uh, there's no problem with buying the cancel notes, however, because I, even I buy them because they're cheaper. And if you want a nice example, and you can sometimes find them in much higher grades than you would find if there's an uncanceled note. So like I said, no problem at all with buying those. Onto the types, uh, you can see, so the first series, they're often all called the Montgomery notes because they were issued before the capital of the Confederacy's moved from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. However, types five and six, the series includes types one through six, uh, types five and six were issued um, after the Confederacy moved the capital to Richmond. Only types one through four should be called Montgomery notes. So that's an interesting little side note. This is T1, $1,000 printed by the National Bank Note Company. The National Bank Note Company printed all the uh, Montgomery notes. So it was the very first bank note issued. It had John C. Calhoun to the left, and then you got Andrew Jackson to the right. He was the seventh US president. Why was he was the president of the union? So why is he on the Confederate bank note? Uh, basically because he supported slavery and so did Calhoun. However, uh, Calhoun supported more than slavery. He wanted lower tariffs for the South, among other things. So that's why he's going to appear on T41 later as well. Uh, this is one of the rarest notes with Fricky listing about 137 left in existence. So that's an RA rarity out of the 607 that were issued. So low issuance number anyways. Uh, but this one was issued from April 5th through June 21st of 1861. I'm gonna zoom in here because this is a good example of a hammer cut cancel. Uh, this is torn a little bit, so that's not good. You really don't want torn cancellations. Um, but that's just sort of an example of hammer cut cancel. You can see it's in the sign of a, a shape of a cross. So that's a hammer cut cancel, and then there's T1. T2 is a $500 that was printed by the National Bank Note Company, and it was also highly popular, uh, issued from April 8th through July 23rd of 1861. Doesn't feature any people. Over to the left, you see Ceres, uh, which is the goddess, the Roman goddess of industry. And then in the center, we have a nice vignette of James Finley's The Crossing, and Smilly was a famous painter back during that time. And they took the took his painting, The Crossing, and then stuck it on here. Uh, this is presumably from a, like a Southern scene. Uh, you see the steam train right here, cattle are right here. And then of course you got the, the uh, cattle driver right here. He's driving the cattle down to the river to drink. Uh, out of the 607 of these that were issued, so again, another low issuance number, there's 137 RA rarities surviving today, like the last one. So another beautiful note, you can just see the green, the green um, lath work right there. And actually, this is an example of punch canceled. Uh, you can see right here. So that's another example of a cancel. T3 was a uh, one printed by the National Bank note, $100. And this one was issued from April 5th through June 21st of 1861. Also devoid of any people on it had um, Minerva, a new figure right here to the left. And if this makes sense, she's the Roman goddess of arts, literature, and then defense of war as well. Uh, and then in the center of Vinya, it's just a random steam train. Uh, it's got a steam tra a track, probably by a, of course, by a station and then the steam train right there. Um, out of these, there were 1,606 issued and then 189, so a little more common than an R8 rarity 
remain today that we know of. The center vignette could be an example of a vignette that doesn't really pertain to the Confederacy because by the start, some interesting facts right here, by the start of the war, the uh, Confederacy only had 9,500 miles of railroad track compared to the Union's over 22,000 miles of track. And I guess maybe it was wishful thinking for the Confederacy because they knew that they needed that railroad track uh, to stay basically stay alive as a nation. However, they didn't have the land, the money, nor the time to build all that track. And it hurt them in the end, probably one of the main reasons they lost the war. This is T4, a $50 printed by the National Banknote Company, last official Montgomery note. And it was manufactured from April 5th through June 21st of 1861. And this time there's a vignette of slaves hoeing. It's either cotton or tobacco, probably cotton it looks like. Uh, but this guy's carrying the cotton and then these two are hoeing it. And then in the far right, you can just see the vignette of a little bit like a corner of a plantation house. And then there were 1,606 of these issued as well. And there are 186 known in existence today, which is again, a little more common than an R8 rarity. T5, we're getting out of the Montgomery notes into the Richmond notes, uh, uh, $100 printed by the Southern Bank Note Company this time. And it was printed just after the capital got moved to Richmond, Virginia from Montgomery. It features a vignette of the Hudson River Railroad in the center. And then to the right, we got a different depiction of Minerva. And then to the left, we have a new figure, Justice. And she's holding, the picture's kind of grainy right here, but you can see she's holding the scales of justice. And then down here uh, is the sword to enforce justice, I guess. Um, August 25th through September 23rd of 1861 is when they were issuing this one. And then 5,798 were made. So you see the issuance numbers jump up as we'll see that when we go through the presentation. There are 501 to 1,000 left in existence today. So an R6 rarity. And uh, in the center, this Hudson River Railroad vignette, it was a railroad from the north, actually. It was in New York, uh, named after the Hudson River in New York. So and it actually went through the Hudson River to run over it. This is T6, a $50 printed by the Southern Bank Note Company. And it has a lot going on in it, like I said up here. Uh, issued from August 25th through September 23rd of 1861. This is an interesting note because of this vignette right here of George Washington. Uh, he's called one of the fathers of the Confederacy. There's some controversy as to whether he should be or shouldn't be. Um, one of the reasons is because why they said he should be is because he was the leader of um, the United States during the War for Independence, and they thought he would support um, the Confederacy breaking free of the Union because he, he and his comrades were trying to break free from Great Britain. However, uh, he stated that they should always, the country should always be unified no matter what, uh, especially in his farewell address, he said that. And he opposed slavery as well going so far as to free, free his own slaves at the end of his life. Um, so that's just sort of some ways he should be uh, called the father of the Confederacy and then some ways he shouldn't be. So there's some controversy there. To the left, we see Justice again. She's got the scales. You can see it a little more clearly now. She's got the scales right here and then the sword. And then in the center, we have on the left, Ceres. So industry, told you you'd see her again. And then to the right, we've got agriculture, also called palace. And then of the 5,798 issued, just like the last one, there's 501 to 1,000 today that are left. So in our six rarity. With that, we are done with the first issue and we move on to the second issue. Another interesting, these are all interesting issues. Um, authorized May 16th of 1861. It was comprised of six notes, just like the last one was. And not many colors were used because they were all lithographed. Um, by Hoyer and Ludwig. T12 was lithographed as well, but by Jules Manouvier instead. Um, so lithography, you can only produce, you can produce colors. Um, you can mainly only produce black and white colors. If you want to produce images and colors, it's going to take a lot of time. And there's a complicated process that involves lots of money that the Confederacy didn't have. So 
they just did black and white. Uh, type 7 through 11, which were printed by Hoyer and Ludwig, uh, were on thick bond paper. They, that didn't wear well. That's why you see a lot of them are really worn and they're not at all in good shape. You can, you, it's almost impossible to find them in good shape, especially types 10 and 11. Um, Hoyer and Ludwig's practices were really far below that of national and southern banknote companies, um, but they were brought on Hoyer and Ludwig were because the national and southern banknote companies were forbidden to print for the Confederacy or any southern states um, by the American Banknote Company, and the American Banknote Company was in turn forbidden by the Union, so the North, uh, to print for the Confederacy. So you have T7, so this is $100 printed by Horan and Ludwig, issued from July 29th through October 22nd of 1861. It uses a new form of printing lithography. It, lithography is actually a pretty interesting process. It involves a flat stone or metal plate and you place the, of course, the paper and the image where the areas where you want the image are coated in a sticky, greasy fluid, so then the ink will adhere to the paper, and then the areas where the image is not wanted, so these blank areas right here, um, are made to reject the ink. And right, so moving on to the note, you see down on the left, uh, George Washington is right here, and then in the center, here's on the left, you see Ceres again, and then on the right, a new figure, Proserpina, uh, she's compared to Persephone, which was the daughter of the Greek goddess of agriculture, Demeter. You might have all heard the story of Persephone and Hades. So that's just sort of Proserpina's comparison. And Proserpina was Roman, too. Uh, 37,155 of these were issued, and 501 to 1,000 remain today, so an R6 rarity. And this is just a, a great example of the Confederacy's ability to produce uh, beautiful notes, even though it's black and white, you can still, it's still pretty and really nice. Uh, this is another rare type. They go for thousands. This is a T8. It's a $50 uh, printed by Hoyer and Ludwig, issued from July 29th through October 22nd of 1861. And then it was also lithographed. Um, it was the first $50 Confederate not to bear interest, which means so there's a long explanation here. The interest rate charged when any amount of money or principal was borrowed was not specified in the actual note. In, sim in simpler terms, uh, you borrowed, say you borrowed, went to the bank, borrowed $100, uh, and there was a 4% interest rate. That 4% interest rate is not going to be on the actual note. In the center, here's George Washington again, and they use the same vignette as they used in this one. And then to the left, we have uh, Tellus, and she's the goddess of the earth. And then it's, it's kind of a cute vignette. It has a little uh, world right here, a little globe, and then a little bird on top. So it's another nice, nice uh, type, and 5,001 to 10,000 of these are left today. So in our four rarity, out of the 123,564 that were issued. So of course we see the issuance numbers are going up. Uh, many banks save them, so they're in high grades. You can easily, you can go on eBay and Heritage and all those different auction sites and easily find 63s, 64s. Uh, if you're lucky, a 65 for not cheap, but they're a little more manageable than other um, Confederate notes. This is T9, uh, $20, and this didn't feature any people either. It had a sailing ship right here in the center. And it was weird because this was actually featured on many of the Northern obsoletes before the outbreak of the Civil War. Uh, the note was produced from July 25th through October 26th of 1861. And another highest, we see the issuance go up again, 264,988 were issued. And there's 5,001, 10,000 that remain today, so an R4 rarity. And this is another one that's hard to, hey, you can find it in high grades, uh, but well cut is, I'll explain what well cut means on the next slide. So here's T10, uh, $10. And this one was issued from July 25th through November 2nd of 1861. And it again didn't feature any people on it. Instead, it had Liberty. It has Liberty two times, actually. To the left, we have Liberty right here. 
And then in the center, we got Liberty seated by an eagle. She's leaning on the battle flag. So there you go. You see the uh, stars and bars flag. I don't know which one this is, uh, if it's the one with seven, nine, 11, or 13 stars. Um, 170,994 of these were issued from that July 25th through November 2nd of 1861. And there's about an R5, R5 rarity, so 1,001 to 5,000 that are left today. And we see, of course, the issues went down a little bit from the last T9, which was 264,988. And these are really hard to find again with a good cut and in a high grade. Most are fine to VF, uh, very fine. Those are just sort of um, ways we can for condition. Um, but the, the well cut, so here, I'll show you right here, it's a good time to explain frame lines. Uh, so the inner frame line is the bolded portion, you can see it right here, and it runs around the whole note, uh, but it's not always like on this one, right here you can see they cut it off right there until you get a boat lake right here, then it starts again. Uh, and then this is the outer frame line right here, the less highlighted or less bolded portion. And a lot of them weren't well cut. They didn't have both frame lines because the tellers and the clerks had to hand cut them because uh, there was such a high demand for many of these notes. And if you find, you know, if you find them in where it's well cut, where it has, I mean, full inner, full, uh, inner frame line is rare, but then full outer frame line, if you have both of them, that's really rare. You, almost can't, they're, they're getting rarer and harder and harder to find nowadays. And you, in my opinion, anyways, you best buy them up because they're pretty, they're going to be pretty rare. They're going to keep getting rare. So, but that's T10 anyways, black and white again. And then T11 is a $5. Uh, again, Hoyer and Ludwig did this one, printed from July 29th through September 7th of 1861. Liberty's featured in the center again. They basically they oopsies, they basically did the same vignette right here. You can see the um, similarities, but instead of doing the battle flag like they did on this one, they took a five instead and put it right here. And then on the left we have a sailor. He's going to appear again. You'll see him all throughout the types, seventy-two types. Uh, he's leaning on a table, and then you got some barrels right here, and presumably a sailing ship. And he's probably, or you can just see the faint outline right here. And he's probably looking out to sea. Uh, these are again, hard to find in a high grade with a really good cut. This one's not well cut again. You can see this is basically the only side that has both frame lines. Uh, there were 73,355 of these that were issued. And of those only 501 to 1,000 so in R6 rarity remain today. Uh, T12, this is this is a really interesting one, um, printed by Jules Manoeuvre from New Orleans, Louisiana. This is one of my favorite types, uh, not necessarily for the design, but just the history behind it. It was issued in 1861. Uh, really, really, in my opinion, very boring, no real intricate designs on it. Uh, therefore, this was the only note that he printed. The fact that it was very boring and also that it was easily counterfeited uh, that's why his contract was terminated. But he basically printed a whole bunch and then he shipped them to Richmond to be distributed for use. And that's why there aren't two dates. That's why it's just 1861 because they released them on uh, one date. They didn't release them from a set date to a set date. Uh, so he shipped the $5 in one shipment and then the $10 in another shipment. However, much of the shipment was stolen. Which shipment? The $10. So robbers broke in, stole most of it, most of the $10, and then when what was left reached Richmond, they were promptly destroyed. Uh, no one knows if any remain today, but if they do, I mean, they're going to be through the The prices are going to be through the roof. There's going to be no telling how high they're going to go uh, because it could be, this would be an example of an R16 rarity, none seen or known. Doesn't mean they're not known because who knows what the robbers did with their share or if someone from the Confederacy saved one while they were burning them, <laughs> who knows. Um, but the $5 arrived safely, those were issued. Uh, 15,556 of these were issued and only 501 to 1,000, so in our six rarity remain today, 
These are expensive, both canceled and uncanceled. Um, the this I mean the maneuvers credit. This was the first type that had a back, and there won't be another back until T forty nine actually. So thirty seven types later, they finally got another back on there. Uh, I've included on the next slide, so you'll see right here. Uh, here's the Bank of Whitfield obsolete from Georgia, Dalton, Georgia. This was actually the um, inspiration for the Confederate States, the T-12 note. So right here, the back, the back was mainly the inspiration, but you can see that it's, it, well, it's identical actually. Uh, that you could call this one a gray back because it has a blue gray back. And many, they didn't wear well, the back especially, Many of the backs are almost gone or even completely gone. Like this one you can see was heavily circulated. So the back's pretty much completely gone. And Manuvrier, just as a side note, he printed this one as well. Um, so now we finished the second series and now we're on to the third series. So this one was much longer than any of the other ones. It is the longest actually, uh, comprised of 25 notes. And it was authorized August 19th of 1861. And it contains many of the most valuable notes, including the T35 Indian Princess note or the T15, uh, which we will get to today. The T15 anyways. Hoare and Ludwig were printers off and on throughout the uh, series, as well as Keating and Ball, they came onto the scene. And then Southern Banknote contributed as well, just for T15. Uh, and well, today anyways, we'll get to that one. But you will also see the numbers of issuance shoot up because more states had seceded and they needed more notes for everyone to be able to use. So on to T13, we have $100. This was by Hoyer and Ludwig, uh, made from October 22nd of 1861 to April 16th of 1862. And because there were 629,284 issued, they are very easy to find today, especially in low grades. Um, uncirculated condition is also very easy to find but it's not easy to find a better uncirculated note with a very good cut, again, full frame lines, uh, because there was such a high demand. Like I said before, the tellers and clerks basically hand cut most of them and they didn't do a very good job a lot of the times. Uh, the note features a standing sailor at the left. And then I'll, I'll include, I have on the next slide, a picture of the whole note and then also the vignette in the center. But anyways, standing sailor left and then you got in the center, the vignette that has sparked some controversy as to whether the people depicted in it are slaves or actually indentured servants. Um, researchers, several researchers have, have dug into this and they found that basically it's indentured servants. Uh, they're not slaves. Indentured servants worked off their debt because they came over from boats um, in England. And then once they worked off their debts, they were free. So another way you can kind of tell is this looks like a poorer family. You can tell by the wooden structure. I'll show you in the back. The wooden structure in the back is sort of crude. Um, it looks like it was hand built. And so of the 629,000 of these 284 issued, um, there were 10,001 to 50,000 that remain today. So our three rarity. Again, you can find them anywhere, but not better in circulated notes with good cuts. So here's the whole, um, here's the whole note. You can see here's the vignette in the center. You got 100s right here. And then there's a standing sailor at, at the left. Down here is the vignette I was talking about. So when I zoom in on him, he's an indentured servant. You can see he's um, hauling up the, the cotton barrel or the cotton bales to the guy up there. And this is the wooden structure I was talking in the back. It's kind of it's kind of crude um, to me, anyways. Looks like a horse stable, maybe. So that's that. And then this is T14 right here, a fifty dollar printed by Horan and Ludwig, issued like the last one, October twenty second of eighteen sixty one to April sixteenth of eighteen sixty two. These are like the T13s, hard to find, choice and circulated condition with a good cut for the same reasons. The, Tellers did not do a good job cutting. On the left, so you have two sailors right here. I don't know, they may be discussing life or something, uh, life on the boat. And then in the center, we have Moneda, and she's actually broken up into two parts. Um, she's the Roman goddess of memory, 
uh, that's moneta. And then Juno moneta is an epithet. So an epithet is a characteristic or trait of the goddess Juno. And Juno was the wife of Jupiter, and he was the king of the gods in Roman mythology. Um, Jupiter can be compared to um, Zeus in Greek mythology, and I guess you could compare Juno to um, Hera in Greek mythology. And then Juno Moneta's name is really the one that gave way to words like money, uh, mint. That's why she's shown by the treasure chests. And she's got the uh, money bags right here, too. And I guess maybe it was wishful thinking for the Confederacy, too. They wish they had more money. <laughs> and they got a train back here. So that's, T, that's T14. T15, one of my favorites, again, we got by, printed by the Southern Bank Note Company. It's a $50. And they printed types 5 through 6 from 5 and 6 from before, uh, made from June, January 9th, January 8th, sorry, through May 15th of 1862. 14,860 of these were issued. Uh, I, I guess I, you can speculate the low issuance number was because maybe the Southern Bank No Company, of course, they weren't supposed to be printing anything for the Confederacy. So they just printed as many as they could in the few days they had or however long they had and issued them before the union could stop them. So just something to think about. You can ponder why um, why there's such a low issuance number there. In the center, we have the vignette of the Hudson River Railroad again, um, which is on T5, and then the train traveling on it. And then in the, at the right, here's Justice. You can see her with the scales again, and then the uh, sword. And then on the left, we have a new figure, Hope, and she's leaning on an anchor. So it's the personification of hope. And there's an R7 rarity, so 201 to 500 are known today. And it shows that the engravers and printers were still really, really talented, even though they may not have been the best ever. Uh, Southern Bank Note Company, again, National and Southern Bank Note Companies, they were both, since their parent company was ABNCO, and ABNCO was really good. Uh, they, I guess they can be included in the skilled engravers uh, part. But so there's T15. T16, this is when Key Engine Ball came onto the scene. It was a $50 printed by them. And 425,944 of these were issued from April 17th through December 10th of 1862. However, you don't find many, they're they're pretty elusive. They're, they're uh, tightly held by collectors as Pierre Fricky likes to say, um, but they're really, really, really hard. You know, they're hard to find anyways, but then they're really, really hard to find in choice XF plus grades with a really good cut, again, fully framed. And this one you can see right here, fully framed, fully framed, fully framed. And then you get up here and they just took a little bit of the top off. So it's not quite fully framed. Um, but in the center, you got Jefferson Davis. So he appears here. And you'll see him later on T50, T57, and T66. He also appears on some of the fractionals, um, the 50 cent notes. It also has right here, you can see on the right and the left, and then also down here by the signatures, it's got intricate green uh, overprints. It's got the 50 in, uh, let's see here, I'll zoom in quick. It's got the 50 in numerical, and then it's got the 50 in letter form. And then down here, it's got another numerical 50. So another nice type. It doesn't have a back on it, um, but it's another nice type. And now we're to, or wait, hold on. R3 rarity, so 10,001 to 50,000 known today. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that. Now we're to my favorite one, probably, probably my favorite one in the whole series. Uh, T17, uh, $20 printed by Hoyer and Ludwig. So the, the black and white part was by Hoyer and Ludwig. It was lithographed. And then they added the green uh, overprint right here. And it's, it's so intricate that people don't really even know what's on it. So we'll take it step by step here. So to the left, we'll do the black and white first. So you got, of course, you got the 20s right here. And then to the left, you have Liberty, uh, depiction of Liberty. And then in the center, of course, she's the depictions of uh, personification of Liberty and Freedom. And then in the center to the left, you have 
commerce and she's the personification of the traits of trade and commerce and she sits to the left of Ceres. Ceres is in the middle and of course we've seen her before industry and then she sits to the left of navigation who is the personification of seafaring and navigation of the 43,732 of these issued a little less than 501 to a thousand remains so an r6 rarity 501 is probably a more accurate number towards that number. So then the green overprint, you got two cherubs. I'm not going to show you where because I want to see on the next slide if, slide if you can discern. I blew it up, so it should be pretty easy. Uh, but down here we have uh, 20s. So we got the 20 in uh, letter form. And then in front of that, we have the 20 in numerical form. And then these are, I think they're cornucopias, I'm pretty sure. So like I said, okay, on this slide, I wanna see if you can discern where the cherub is here. It's pretty easy to spot because I blew it up for you. This is the one on the right side. There's two, one on the right and then one on the left, but this is the right side. So I'll give you a second to discern where it is. I'm going to go ahead and reveal it for you. So again, this is the one on the right side. So it's right here. You can see on the, uh, this is the head. And then he sort of kind of blends in right here to the rest of the overprint. And then down here, you can see a little bit of his chest and then some of his arms. And then if we go back, I'm going to zoom in now that you see that one. Here's the other one. This, the right one's a little bit easier to see than the left one because the left one's hidden by uh, writing. So you can't really see it, but you can just sort of make out, here's his head and then some of his arms and then his chest. I already went through that. And then I thought I would show you two. Here's my, uh, I got them right here, but you probably, it's, it's, um, Oh, backwards. It's a mirror image, so I thought I'd put it on here instead. Um, but I've got this is my T17 um, in my collection, so it's it's a really nice note. Of course, the uh, green overprint is really nice for a 20. Uh, the PMG we noted a little bit of this rust right here. Uh, this is really hidden, so really you're talking about this uh, probably from a paper clip. They started in a paper clip and it rusted over over time. Um, but a lot of these, what I've seen is, and I'll show you on the next slide, actually, I've seen that they, the black, the C, especially the C and the O and the N and the F on this, and then also the, um, the, it blends into the green. Some, somehow there's like some oxidation or a chemical reaction and the green blends in with the black. Um, but this is a nice note with none of that. Um, so that's my, and also it's well cut. These, I would, would like to mention as well, these, um, this type is really, really notorious for being badly cut. And this one's pretty nicely cut. You got a full frame, full frame lines, both inner and outer there, full there, and then full there. And then to the side, they just cut off a little bit of the outer frame line, but the inner frame line is all there. So it's a full inner frame line anyways. So a really nice note, but that's mine. And then also um, here's, here's the fade example. Like I said, uh, I'll zoom in right here. And you got the, so you can see the, and then C, O, N, F, especially. This is all pretty much blended in. You hardly can see it. And then over here too, you see the T and the E and the S, and then the S as well. Plate numbers, plate letters blended in. Um, still, this one is still a nice note actually overall because the green is pretty, pretty nice on here, but just a little bit of that chemical reaction that I was talking about. And with that, uh, if there's any questions, Oh, you're you're muted. <laughs> that is true. I'm still muted. Sorry. Uh, how does the frame line figure in the grading of the currency? Is one um, question that's in the chat bar. 
Um, well, the, yeah, PMG or, uh, most, actually most of the major grading companies, uh, have kind of become not, not lax, um, but they've just, they've given it a little more wiggle room because it's, they're so old, you know, <laughs> and they were hand cut. So they're not always going to be, um, perfect. They're not always going to be perfect frame lines. Oh, sorry here. I'm just trying to get my uh, email up here for anybody. Um, but yes, the, the margins do affect the grade. Um, it can be the difference between like, if you have a really high grade note and everything is perfect on it, perfect, perfect, no folds, no pinholes, no anything. And the margins wonky, it could be a difference between a 65 and a 64 or something like that. Even the, Lower grades are mostly with the um, folds and the pinholes, all that that you usually find. But, yeah. You may have addressed this. I um, you know, you had mentioned with the counterfeits many times through the presentation, but in the beginning a lot. Uh, one of the identifiers being between the the black ink and the brown ink. It seems like such an easy thing to do to just do brown ink why I, was it just cheaper or what was the point why, why why would they make that mistake well they were yeah and i mean a lot of, nowadays there's more education obviously on this but back sure. then most people weren't really looking at the signatures they'd say oh you know that's a five dollar bill okay there you go and sure. the tellers or the um in the stores they wouldn't really look at it either right. and a lot of times these counterfeits could circulate for years and years and years and years and just not get noticed and then finally oh shoot this is a counterfeit uh, but yeah like i said there's a lot more education on this now so a lot more talks have been done and books and everything so now people can look at that and you know that makes sense well uh, sorry one more thing it was just to get more out because uh, if they didn't have to forge the signatures every time because I mean, because every signer was unique. They signed their name unique. And if they're hand signing every single note, that's going to take quite a while. So they just sometimes printed it because they figured ah, people aren't going to notice it. And it's just a small price to pay to get more out so I can spend more money and make more money, basically. Sure. Um, Robert uh, Gordon was asking, are there plans for another seminar that will go over the T18 through T72 notes? Yes, there is plans. Um, I have to, yeah, schedule it. But yes, yes, I would love to do more of these. And possibly an uh, offshoot of this would be to talk more about uh, counterfeits and PF varieties and all all that fun stuff. But that's a whole nother beast. So that's that deserves a presentation, a whole presentation. <laughs> okay. Ed, um... And I he asking, do the dates determine change of series? Um, yeah, let's see here. Let's go over to the type so I can show. Uh, so yeah, I mean the the uh, not not always because some of the dates were different, and there's I mean there's different uh, like 1861. Um, there. There were like, I can't remember how many series were done just in 1861. This one was done in 1861. Uh, this one was done, third series was done in 1861. So there's different series in 1861 that were done. Um, I, there's numerous sources out there that you can go. I mean, I can email you some if you want to or something like that, uh, if you want to do something like that. But I can email you. There's a set date to a set date of... Uh, how I don't know why I didn't put that in there. I thought I put that in there. Uh, but there's like a set date to a set date of what, you know, how long it was issued from. Let me go back to the slide, sorry. Sorry, guys, whoever wants my email. <laughs> this might be a follow up or maybe a different question, but um, seems like a follow up. What are the differences between the series? Um, they're just they're just ways that they broke up because um, it'd be hard to do seventy two notes all in one series. So they did. It's just ways they broke up the the um, issues. You know, they just broke up the notes into separate issues. So there weren't so many. There weren't 
15 different $5 circulating at one time. Uh, I mean, it could be an easier way to count if that, if that was the case, it could be an easier way to counterfeit you know, people because you might not catch as many. I believe we've hit all the questions that were on both the chat and the Q and A. If I've missed anything, please let me know. But, uh, Oh, wait, uh, let's see, just one came through. Can you mention the difference between R. Duncan and B. Duncan? And this is from John Bess. Yeah, so B. Duncan is basically, like I said before, uh, Bland Duncan. The R could have been, I don't know if it's, it could have been, um, they just didn't, when they were engraving it, the counterfeiters, they just maybe couldn't get the B all the way. Uh, you can, I mean, you can kind of see there, there's a little, I, like I said, this picture is kind of grainy, but you can see in a sort of an attempt, like right here at a B and then a little bit right there. Uh, but this looks more like an R. So R, R really didn't stand for anything. <laughs> uh, it, it should be B, Glenn Duncan, but uh, let me see if I can try to zoom in on this one. But you can see the B clearly right here. Sure. See, it's closed. Um, but Bland Duncan, so that's the printer that we talked about before. Right there, right, right there. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Well, and there is um, Caleb's email address. If anybody has further questions, I um, want to be respectful of everyone's time, and I don't see any other questions coming through at the the moment. So. Um, I just want to thank you, Caleb, um, for such a wonderful and educational presentation. And I hope everyone enjoyed it and learned as much as I did. Um, again, I want to take the time to thank Graysheet for the partnership with the ANA eLearning Academy. And we hope that you guys will join us for, for many future webinars. And everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.